Thank you. Like so many of you, I am a lifelong learner. And what's really cool about that is I become a better teacher because I learn from everybody around me. I learn from my students. I learn from my colleagues, my administrators. But I will tell you, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would become a better teacher because of this man right here, James Whitey Bulger. <laughs> Stay with me, please. Uh, <laughs> So at Aponiquit, we uh, use the National History Day program to teach the research process to our ninth grade students. And for those of you who don't know what National History Day is, uh, it's basically science fair for history. Each year there is a uh, theme that the students develop a topic on, they conduct extensive primary and secondary research, and then they present their findings uh, through a variety of different avenues. They could do a live performance, a website, a poster exhibit. Uh, so it's a great process, it's a hands-on process. Uh, so, once they're done with that in ninth grade, they can, if they'd like to, come back and do it again because there's a competition component to it as well. There are different competitions all the way up to the national level. And I had, uh, two years ago, I had three students come back to participate in National History Day. Not so much because of their love of history, though they did have that, but they came back because they're that student who's ultra competitive. So the, the conversation really started with, we're doing History Day again and we're going to nationals this time. And we're like, oh, well, you know, it's about the history too and the learning. Like, no, we're going to nationals. Uh, so they, they came to me and they asked, they're like, you know, we want to do a local topic because we've noticed that uh, the projects that seem to win, they go local. So they were asking me for some ideas and I was just throwing things out there in a brainstorming session. Obviously we have so much history with the revolution. We have amazing women's history in Massachusetts as well. And at the time I was like, oh yeah, and then there's Whitey Bulger who's all over the news and it was a very passing thought. They had never heard of the guy and that was that and they went their own way. And then they came back a couple weeks later and they said, okay, we've got our topic uh, for History Day, which by the way, the theme that year was leadership and legacy. <laughs> So I said, oh yeah, what is it? And they're like, we're going to do that Whitey Bulger guy. <laughs> okay. So like any good teacher, I want to encourage, right, creativity. My students are looking to take a creative risk, and uh, I'm terrified, but I'm supportive. Uh, so they did a lot of research, and they worked so hard to develop this website. Because what they wanted to do is they wanted to step outside their comfort zones. They wanted to step outside the box and get creative. They thought, what if we looked at history uh, and leadership in history through a negative lens? Not all leadership is positive, right? And I was just so excited about that because that's what we call historical thinking. The idea that the students use primary and secondary research to develop their own narratives and their own conclusions about history. So they worked really hard on this. They uh, did a lot of reading. They got to read uh, more than one book on uh, the high crimes of Whitey Bulger. And through that process, they started to reach out to people that were involved in this story. And one of the people that they worked with uh, was Shelley Murphy from the Boston Globe, who co-wrote the book on Whitey Bulger. And she was so helpful to the kids. She reached back out to them and she said, great, let me put you in touch with this person and let me give you this feedback on your project. And it was amazing watching their eyes light up and they'd come in and they'd tell me about the new insight they had or the new part of the page that they've developed. And I was just thrilled as their educator. But remember, this is a competition and we're here to win. <laughs> So they wanted to dig deeper, and they were really encouraged by the support that they got from the people that they had already talked to. So one day when we were working on the project, they had kind of said, oh yeah, what would happen if we wrote a letter to Whitey Bulger and asked him what he thinks his legacy is? And I was like, oh yeah, that might be cool, and then we kept going, and that was that. <laughs> Until about uh, two or three weeks later, when I got a text message, I was at my parents' house from one of the students, and the text just read, he wrote back, and there were a lot of exclamation marks. <laughs> and I thought to myself, uh-oh. <laughs> so I was kind of panicking, didn't know if I'd have a job by the end of the week. Uh, my dad thought it was really cool. I'm hyperventilating into a paper bag. And, <laughs> and it turns out that's exactly what happened. They had written a letter to Whitey Bulger, and they had asked in that letter, what do you think your legacy is? And he wrote back, and he has great handwriting. <laughs> and we started to read the letter, and it was fascinating, because here we had, although very controversial, an actual artifact of history, right? We, we had the ultimate primary source for this project. <laughs> and we started to break it down, and man, what awesome learning happened around this. 
Uh, in the letter, he first immediately denied that he had ever done any of the things we had heard about, that he was a myth of the media. And he also had a, a line that said, if you want to make crime pay, go to law school. But one thing that really stood out to us in this letter is this quote right here. He wrote, my life was wasted and spent foolishly, brought shame and suffering on my parents and siblings, and will end soon. And this was a big deal. Because what the girls had learned throughout their research is that he doesn't seem to be very remorseful. And here in the letter that he wrote to them was what seemed to be his first issuance of some sort of remorse. So we had a lot of conversations about this. Well, what do you, what do you think this means? He doesn't seem to be remorseful towards the victims. He could be doing this because he has an appeal hearing coming up. But that's what this is all about. We were looking at a primary source. We were analyzing for point of view. We were analyzing for historical context. We were doing real history work, and it was awesome. So we get to the competition. We go to the state finals, and they don't go to nationals. Remember, this is what this was supposed to be all about originally. <laughs> so they're crushed. They did win some cool awards. They won an award for best Massachusetts history project. Uh, they won an award for best use of a primary source document. <laughs> but they didn't get to nationals, and that's really what this was all about in the beginning. So while they were doing this project and they were working with Shelley Murphy, uh, Shelley had, she was also blown away by this letter. And she had asked, hey, can I do an article on the on this letter you guys got. And the girls were so mature about it and they were like, you know what, we'd like to wait until after the competition because we don't want it to be a distraction. So after the competition, we looped back in and we all decided, okay, we'll, we'll do a, a story about this. So Shelly came in and she interviewed the girls and we got to relive the experience for a little bit. And sure enough, in the next Sunday Globe, on the cover was our story about the letter and about Whitey Bulger. But what I really didn't anticipate is that it didn't stop at the cover of the Boston Globe, it just started there. So within 48 hours, our story was all over the national news. Time Magazine, the NBC Nightly News, the Huffington Post, it was everywhere. This thing blew up, and I felt like an agent. I'm on the phone, and, oh yeah, Inside Edition wants to do an interview with us. I'm like, well, I don't know, because we gotta do WJAR too, so. It was wild. And it was a tough experience, too, because I'll tell you, you know they always say, don't read the comments, right? But then when it's a story about you, you tend to read the comments, and I'm here to tell you, don't read the comments. <laughs> because this is tough for a lot of people to understand. Most of us, we didn't learn history this way, right? So when you have a story like this, a lot of people are thinking, oh my God, these, these girls are glorifying a terrible person, and that's not at all what this project was about, right? So that was challenging as well. But like any other news story, 48 hours go by, there's a churn, and your 15 minutes of fame are over. But when that happened, my uh-oh moment became an aha moment. That I had actually, even if by accident, engaged in authentic learning. Right? That this was more than just a project. It was more than just a resource from a book. It's never, I, I hope, ever going to be an item on a standardized test. Because that's, you, that's not what this kind of learning is, right? So it really got me thinking, what other ways and in what other capacities can I bring the joy of learning to my students through authentic learning and authentic assessment? And that's something that I continue to work on to this day. And I'm very much inspired by the work of these girls. And by the way, this started as a competition. It didn't end like that. This changed their lives too. And two of the students have decided that they're going to major this fall in journalism because of this experience. Yeah, and that's what it's about. So as I wrap up my story, I just simply want to ask us collectively, as a professional organization, as a union of teachers, what are we going to do to make sure that all students get to enjoy this type of authentic learning in every classroom? Thank you.